Well, yeah, it is nice to, to, to come out tonight because uh, I, I will speak a little bit about the politics and things like that for a, just a short brief moment before touching on parenting. I want to share with you a very important book. One of the things that is a, a detriment or a barrier towards learning Torah in depth is language. I used to think that uh, Talmud study was not something I was interested in because I wasn't fluent in Aramaic. I must have missed that uh, course when I was a kid. You, you need to be able to overcome that barrier. I did not have the family custom in Rashi's house that Rabbi Mishul's house also had was on Saturdays they only spoke Hebrew. This wasn't an uh, invention of Eliezer ben Yehuda, it was actually something that the greatest of the rabbis had instituted. So I was not fluent in uh, Hebrew or Aramaic, so it was frustrating. So I was very excited, little did I realize that I should have been fluent in German too, or at least Yiddish, because the great Rav Samson Rafal Hirsch wrote a commentary, not in Hebrew, not in Aramaic, but in German. They say it's worth knowing German to uh, study Rav Hirsch in the original. I, I can't do that. Now, this is actually version 2.0 in English. There was a British translation, someone who was, who was German, who was in England, uh, Mrs. Herschler, uh, was a genius in Baltimore. She translated the original uh, Rev. Herschel, much much of it, with, with, uh, with uh, Dr. Levy. And um, it was very much like <laughs> listening to my mother speak English, which is kind of like Shakespeare, but in modern terms. is like, I mean, I get it, but not really. Um, so my, my great-grandson, uh, Dr. Bondi, and his son Mark, who's a friend of mine, they retranslated Rev. Hirsch instead of in German or in British English or German English into American English. Right? And that's this set. I highly, highly recommend, if you want to see in-depth, uh, commentary in English, in American English, in it, but a real um, uh, in-depth study, Rav Hirsch is probably the father of modern Jewish thought, and he defended the Torah against its detractors and those who would uproot it from its holy sources. That said, I'll, yeah, I'll share you a taste of what he says in the Chumash, and then something that perhaps makes him different than some of the more traditional uh, commentaries, which is slightly um, controversial, which may be why you may not hear from me for another two or three years. So, um, but the, the first thing is this. What is it, you know, that you have to really cut through all the verbiage? There's been billions and billions of dollars spent on, on these elections. If we would just ban all uh, I think all the politicians in the country should ban all political contributions and say, take that money and feed all the poor people in the country. Now that would be something I'm interested in. But uh, they don't ask people like us what we should do. They just want to spend, I think, uh, spending $100 million. It doesn't even matter if in Texas one wins that $100 million on it. You could literally feed every... It's, it's mind-boggling the amount of money. What is important when you're thinking about voting was the difference between this week's parsha between Yaakov and Esav. Yaakov was a pretty straight shooter, and his mother saw that. But his father kind of was taken in a little bit by his brother Esav. They were twins, they looked the same, which we'll get back to. That was one of the problems a little bit. But it says two things. It says it seemingly repeats something unnecessarily. And we know one of the rules in the Torah is it never repeats things unnecessarily. So if it does, it's to tell you something. So in the 25th chapter of Bereshis and Toldos, in the 27th Pasuk, it says, well, they grew up, Esau was a hunter, a uh, Yodea Tzayid, someone who knew how to hunt, and Yaakov was a more scholarly person in the tents. And then the next Pasuk says something new, seemingly. Yitzhak loved Esau because he was Tzayid, but it says he was a hunter, Bepeev. So first of all, it just said he was a hunter. Why does it say this? And it says it differently beside Bepeev. So Rev. Her Rev Hirsch translated, it doesn't say he was a hunter, he used to talk about hunting. He said he was a hunter also with his mouth. So this is a paraphrasing of Rashi in the Midrashim. He had the gift of being able to manipulate others verbally. 
He was a hunter with his mouth. He could not only hunt physically, but he could hunt verbally. He could speak in a way that was cunning and cut. He used to pretend that he was the most righteous person to his father. He, um, he was known as a paradigm of uh, honoring parents, right? I joked at my father's funeral, which is probably inappropriate, but I, I said, I wish I was a better son. I said, I have three other names. Perhaps I should have had a fourth name. They should have named me a sub also. Maybe I would have had a shot at being a better son. But the, I joke, it, it's only a subtle joke because the, the Gemara says, who was the greatest fulfiller of honoring one's parents? a sub, right? Certainly not a simple person. But this was part of his cunning nature. And he had fooled his father. And that's actually the way Rehearse translates. How could it be that... Um, his wife would go, you know, behind his back and get Yaakov to go and, and fool him. Is to demonstrate him how, look, look how you're being taken in. Look how you're being fooled. If, if Yaakov could pretend he's Esau and he's not what he seems, so Esau's not what he seems. And that was kind of the Hirsch's approach to it. That wasn't the controversial thing that he said. But the point is, it's, it's important to cut through the people who are... Um, smooth-tongued and talking to just convince us of the point as opposed to the truth, which was uh, Yaakov's approach to things, which was cut to the chase of what the core of the truth is. With the last couple minutes, I'll say the following. There's two different approaches among the uh, traditional commentaries, not the more modern commentaries, about how much can you humanize our ancestors. I'm sorry to say I don't even want to dignify a very negative approach to something about the ancestors that's uh, online people say the most horrific things certainly that we don't even rehearse would say you don't you don't denigrate our ancestors but how human should you make them should you make them like angels should you make them if the angels the first ones like angels we're like people right or should you treat them more like human beings so that we can learn how we as human beings in our own basic uh, you know lives can deal with things it's a debate. The great Ravar and Kotler said, do not humanize the ancestors. They were great. They're angelic. We don't even understand a bit of what they were about. You can talk about them as paradigms of righteousness, but that's it. Do not go into the humanization of things because to compare them to us, as my teacher once said to me in his great wisdom, he says, wait a minute, are you arguing with me? I said, yes. He says, let's compare those two thoughts. Um, you arguing with me is like, I don't know, Einstein arguing with... Uh, a watermelon. <laughs> so I didn't say that I whispered under my breath, well, who's a watermelon? But, but, the, but the point is, it was, like, very much so. You, you can't compare us to the ancestors. It's just not even, we can't even compare ourselves to our great-grandparents, much less our ancestors. That's how Rav Iron Cutler would view it. Rev Hirsch would say, nope. In fact, the Torah goes out of his way, and to heal him to talk about King David's shortcomings, and all through the Torah, it doesn't pretend that their ancestors were angels. They were actually humans who had flaws and struggled with overcoming their character flaws. And that's to teach us, that's what we should do too. So, in this situation, he said there was actually a flaw in the first parenting kind of issue that developed with children. They were twins, seemingly identical, um, but certainly twins. And they made a mistake. And this, Rev Hirsch took a lot of heat for. But basically he said it was a parenting lesson. That rule of parenting number one, lesson number one, the Torah wants to say is, mother and father have to be on the same page. Even when they disagree, they have to present a united front to the children. Number two is, don't judge your kids by their looks. Because anybody who's had more than, anybody in here a parent of more than one child? Yeah, so you, all, you did the same thing I did. Well, the first one's a red-headed boy. second one's a red-headed boy. Let's do the exact same thing with them. How'd that work for me? Not well. So the, the point is, just because they look the same doesn't mean a thing. The, even identical twins, it's Hanoch Lenaro Pidarko. You have to know each child, their own unique um, character, their own unique um, innate attributes, and educate according to their unique personality, not just because they look the same. They're not the same. No two children are the same. One size fits? One. One, exactly. Um, it's not one size fits all. Jewish education is one size fits one. 
Sometimes you can extrapolate beyond that, but it's first one size fits one, and then you can talk about what are general rules. So that, that was the real issue. Esau and Yaakov should not have been getting the same exact education. Esau was a kinesthetic learner, he was physical, he was a hunter. He was not the one who was the book studying um, and verbal and uh, type of studious person who had gained from texts. And since they didn't realize that early enough because they were not on the same page, this led to, instead of Yaakov and Esau partnering, it led to Yaakov and Esau having sibling rivalry. And therefore, it was a little bit of a, a, um, a criticism on some small level of how Yitzhak and Rivka raised their two children as twins being exactly the same. And so the lessons are, parenting-wise, and Rev Hirsch says, this is why the Torah does point out flaws, is that we should know. Even if you think slightly different about your children, you should have a united front. And you should never, on the same uh, flip side of that, never treat them exactly the same. <coughs> each child is unique, each child is different, each child needs their own. It, it, equal doesn't mean same. Equal means what they need according to what their personalities and their um, individual personalities and characteristics dictate. And with that, um, see some a little bit of the taste of how Rav Hirsch approaches Chumash, and um, since then, you know, we've seen the, the outcomes of it, and hopefully we'll, we'll have learned those lessons, which is why we study Chumash to begin with, to study these great people. Good night. <laughs>